Focus with FAR, a discussion of national issues that matter to the Central Coast, with 20th District Congressman Sam Farr. Hello. Welcome to another episode of Focus with FAR. It was 50 years ago when the First Lady of the United States, Lady Bird Johnston, launched a major initiative to beautify America. Part of that historic initiative was the Highway Beautification Act. This landmark piece of environmental legislation sought to create scenic highways throughout the, our nation. Highway 1 in Big Sur is an example of that, the first California state scenic highway. Here to talk about Highway Beautification Act and the value of scenic roads and the value of aesthetics in a rural area is a great friend of mine, Peter Welch. Welcome very much to our program, Peter. And let me tell you, you're from Vermont. Uh, you're a member of the House Tourism Caucus. Uh, you've been in, in Congress for about eight years now? That's right. Were you in the state I, legislature before that? I was. I did two tours of duty there. I was uh, in my first time eight years, and I was Senate president. And then uh, I ran for election and lost and uh, came back. And I'd been gone so long that uh, my colleagues elected me Senate president again when I returned <laughs> Uh, in 2000, and then I came and joined you here in Congress. Well, I think you're one of the most popular members of Congress because you have this wonderful, bubbly, exciting enthusiasm <laughs> about things, and it, it just, it, it's very infectious. And, and one of the things that I've found very interesting when we started this tourism caucus is the um, understanding that you have, and perhaps even more so because Vermont being a rather small state compared to California, and uh, a state that seems like lots of people just want to go to it to be tourists and to see, and the, and you have really captured that at the state level and local level. I, could you just sort of explain that culture of rural aesthetics that Vermont has yeah. been able to? Well, you know, you're right about that, Sam. It's interesting. Um, we had a lot of dairy farms. It used to be that there were more cows than people, and there were large farms and very small farms. Uh, and, of course, the cultivated land in the Green Mountains. Um, it, a lot of people think of Ireland when they think of Vermont with some of the places that they've seen. So there's a tradition of agricultural life where the farmers were the custodians of the land. There were small roads, not before the interstates. Uh, it was tough to get to, but it was very beautiful when you were there. And then, of course, we had the advent of, of the interstate. And it created some pressure on how would we retain the beauty uh, of an unspoiled agricultural community. And it's very interesting because it was very much Republicans who were in charge that had the foresight to realize that even as they were promoting change in a more economically diverse state, we had to hang on to that tradition of the beauty of Vermont. And a couple of things that they did uh, when we had our interstates, they fought hard to have why a very wide median between the north and the south uh, highways. So anybody driving into Vermont, they're not looking at the headlight, oncoming headlights in the opposite lane. They're looking at this beautiful scenic, and this month, beautiful uh, fall foliage right. as they drive around. A couple of other things they did, they banned billboards. We don't have billboards in Vermont. And it is astonishing, and this is all Republicans who did this, uh, well, I remember on the national scene, the Rockefeller family was very engaged in this. The whole because remember zoning and land use planning right. very controversial. And the but Rockefellers the idea, had a, a place in uh, a modest little place uh, uh, in Woodstock, Vermont, where there was a, a Rockefeller hotel. But also that's where Lawrence Rockefeller's wife was from. So and Lawrence were, Rockefeller was sort of initiating a national, my father was in the state legislature in California, got caught up and very interesting. So, I mean, he said just very, you know, really intellectual people committed to preserving the, the, the sort of the aesthetics and the cultural values inherent in the, in the great American. Well, it's true and they, they, they had an ethic <clears throat> and that is that you leave it uh, cleaner than you found it. Yeah. And they apply that not just to some of their estates, and you know they had a economic ability to do this that most Americans don't have, but they also uh, had that ethic in public spaces 
where it in fact does benefit all of us. You must what a what a fight because I remember the billboard fight when my father carried the legislation in California to create That's scenic great. highways. That's great. And you know, it was a, the people that opposed it was a bill for it. Very, very powerful lobby, even more of a powerful lobby now, seven hundred billion dollars a year in outdoor advertising. And even though we have created this incentive in federal law, which this Beautification Act that we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of created and gave gave a 10 percent uh, incentive to states that would adopt, like Vermont, restrictions on billboards. It's almost never been enforced because, of course, the lobby fought back on that. Yeah, and you know, I remember uh, this was uh, contested when I first went to Vermont, which is in 1974. And, you know, a lot of the small businesses were really fearful that if they couldn't put signs up everywhere, their businesses would be uh, ignored. And, they, and, you know, it's understandable yeah. that a small business would have that fear or a big business that wanted to advertise and get people to come in. Uh, so it was a long battle where there was an enormous amount of anxiety among a lot of good Vermont small business owners uh, that felt that this would really harm them. How and, did you solve that problem? Well, was generic signs it, it and things was, like that. What we we did a couple of things. First of all, there was a political battle, and in, in, uh, the, the folks uh, uh, pr who were in, f in favor of no billboards prevailed, uh, but there was a lot of tension about that. And then two things happened. One is we do have generic signs, uh, so that you can have relatively small, uniform style signs at, at various spots. Uh, that allow people to direct to understand you to, that there's lodging or gas or exactly. or uh, and, meals. <clears throat> well, which, there's uniform signs like that on the on the interstate, the, those big panel signs. But no no private signs on the interstate. But off road, there was some uniform Vermont signs that businesses could use. Secondly, and this is what was the, really the most remarkable, businesses found that the overall benefit of having a sign-free, billboard-free state added to the attractiveness for visitors to come and they ultimately concluded that it was good for business to have our highways free of the clutter. And what guts now, it, and political guts it must have taken because I just know the struggle. I mean, my father was threatened, all kinds of, uh, and, and in fact he lost his election uh, that year. and. I want to run a little clip here in a minute about uh, what we did in dedicating right. Highway 1 after he passed the legislation. But um, And that's one of the iconic highways we, in the country. It's almost as pretty as a Vermont highway, Sam. <laughs> 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 yeah, the Big Sur Coast is almost as pretty as a Vermont almost. highway. <laughs> but what you've amazing. done yeah. politically, I mean, this is the will of local government and state government to really get behind... Yeah, and I don't know if we could do it now. In a, you know, it's interesting. Vermont is now a more democratic state, but it's had a tradition, uh, even uh, when the Republicans were in charge, of, of uh, environmental stewardship in public places. You know, one of the other things that helped clean up our highways was Vermont was one of the first states to pass a bottle deposit return bill, and uh, and that was really contested when I was a young lawyer in Vermont. And I remember a lot of Republicans speaking very bluntly to some of the beer companies that, hey, this thing works, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. the highways that used to have a lot of beer bottles out there and cans uh, were, were significantly cleaned up just a result of the, of the bottle deposit. deposit yeah. yeah. You put value in the trash and it doesn't get thrown out the window. That's right. Um, Save those empties, you can get another six-pack. What do you think, uh, I, because I'm trying to be reflective in this, and obviously there's a not, lot of nostalgia here for my father. I mean, m my situation is that I'd gotten out of the Peace Corps and I came home and my father said, the First Lady of the United States is coming here. Wow. And to uh, do this dedication down on the Big Sur Highway, he was under incredible pressure by the state party because she wasn't coming to campaign for the governor who was in a tough race against Ronald Reagan, Pat Brown, mm -hmm. or to campaign for the United States senators or the Congress members. It was essentially for a state senator. But he had been wow. very involved in this movement of trying to develop policy at the local level where people would appreciate aesthetics. And I think that his leadership not you know wasn't sensational at the time but it was controversial particularly among the, the outdoor advertising business um, but it, it, it like our area like yours in Vermont I mean we are pretty much clutter free um, 
of all this glitter around. And the Monterey Peninsula is just, you know, we, we sell scenery for is our biggest economic value. It's attracted universities, it's attracted, uh, and our, our agriculture is incredibly, because mm -hmm. we're not cluttered highways, you can really see all this stuff. No, think, that's exactly right. Uh, but we don't have a will to even put that on the menu anymore. Well, it's true, and it's, it's very disturbing. You know, if you go to, we don't spend money on public spaces. I mean, it's getting so bad in Congress right now. You and I are both frustrated about this. We don't even spend money on highways. I mean, we can't pass a highway mm -hmm. bund, a, f a bill that has long-term funding for it. You know, the last highway bill was funded for three months. I mean, uh, tell me a bridge that can be built or repaired in three months. It can't be done. They well, can't even get the financial instrument signed. Yeah, and, and part of that, I think, is the, the notion of government is under assault. I mean, here we are in the House of Representatives where we had a speaker resign, and now he can't leave. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's Mr. Boehner, and that was because uh, there was a, a group that felt that we should shut government down unless they got their way on the funding of Planned Parenthood. But what that reflects relative to what we're talking about public spaces is the difference uh, in the collective effort, Republican and Democrat, that was there around the time of your dad, where there would be a fight about the signs, yes or no, because there were legitimate economic concerns by some of these businesses. What'll happen to us? That's a fair question. But there was an acceptance by the opponents and proponents that it actually was a governmental function to have this debate and to make a political decision, political in the good sense that it's a shared uh, benefit or a shared burden, uh, about protecting the scenic value of the public space. That was seen as a legitimate role for government. And then uh, people with vision like your dad and a good deal of courage, because he was going against powerful local economic interests, which are always the toughest in politics uh, to, to address, he hung in there, and he did it. And now looking back, I mean, you couldn't find a person, I'm sure, in Big Sur who isn't grateful. They may not know it was your dad that did it, but they're grateful uh, to him for doing it. Now, as we debate here in Congress, there's a big debate about whether we should even function. So it's a di it was a different time, and we had that in Vermont. So our conservative Republicans were, you know, small government, low taxes, but they believed in public responsibility. And, and the environmental movement, and the conservation movement really was they were the, the Republican-led. They were the ones in and Vermont. now it's <laughs> Republicans trying to tear it apart. Right. Uh, I, I want to just show you this clip because this was uh, a ladybird coming out to this. It was a big deal. And, and your dad, is he in and it? Ansel Adams and, and my dad. I don't Ansel know Adams? His, Ansel Adams. Was front, the story about Ansel is really funny is that Ansel was there to take a photograph. Oh, and I'm it was surprised. during the Vietnam War, and uh, here he is with his camera with his hood over it, and a big beard and, and hippie-looking guy, and the Secret Service <laughs> grabbed him, thinking <laughs> he was there to as a protester. And my father and the, and the it's first Ansel lady, Adams, Secret Service, let go of that man. He's a national hero, not a. Oh uh, God, that's, a, that's a great story. So uh, and this uh, this was a little clip of of, of made uh, 50 years ago when she dedicated the California Big Sur Highway as California's first state scenic highway. Of all the roads that carry travelers up and down the coastal ranges of California, none offers more sheer excitement per mile than the Big Sur Scenic Highway, which soars for 80 miles along the western brink of the North American continent from the Carmel River to Morro Bay. This is the Big Sur country, a stretch of sculptured coastline famous for both its dramatic confrontation with the sea and for its artists and writers who have been drawn to its natural beauty. Standing near one of the most exquisite bridges in the West at Bixby Creek, Mrs. Johnson dedicated the Big Sur Highway and its wild symphony of mountain, sea, and sky to all who would come and share it. At mid-afternoon, the First Lady arrived at the place called Wild Bird, the self-designed retreat of California's noted architect and conservationist, Nathaniel Owings. There, resting from her tour, in a garden perched some 600 feet above the surf, Mrs. Johnson vicariously enjoyed another of the Big Sur's greatest treasures, privacy. 
So just think uh, if that highway had just been cluttered with billboards and sort of, you know, advertising it with condors in the next 10 miles and sea lions and sea otters and stop here and we'll have, uh, you know, uh, fast foods and so on. So it's it, that, that was ability so to save that was not, that's not what you saw there is not uh, public land. That's a state bridge, iconic uh, Bixby Creek Bridge, probably one of the most photographed bridges in the world. But all the land around it is in public ownership or private ownership, so it's our local zoning and the passion for doing that. And my my point of and and I think what I'd love to do because I think rural tourism can be such a growth industry in America. You need to have access, which are roads. You need to have interpretation, but that interpretation doesn't have to be at, uh, commercial advertising. Mm -hmm. It can be on your iPhone as a, as you can interpret the constellations at night uh, above you or as we can inter interpret bird calls or interpret you know what is this a Monterey Cypress or a Monterey oh, Pine. Exactly. So, I mean, we, we have so much ability to oh, incorporate technology into this little device that we have on our in our in our belt and uh, in purse and be able to create access and then there's there's always going to be need people in there for the services and everything and I think states like yours in Vermont can really and you have by by really as a preserving the but well, look at true. what it, look there's, what the uh, what do you call them, the leaf peepers that's what we call them and we're glad to have them They're and they the, come up the uh, Audubon Society of Leaves right that, uh, that's right Pe I mean people come from far and wide uh, for the famous Vermont foliage and I hope some of your folks from Big Sur uh, come and in fact, I'd love to go to Big Sur. I was sold by that uh, beautiful uh, 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 video that you just showed. Well, we'll do it. I'll go. I'll, you you know, show me the leaves, and I'll show you the. See, I. The but seed. I. We've got to restore that 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 ethic that your dad really was so representative of, and uh, you know, it's it, people love it. You know, there, it's always a challenge when you're making a concrete decision where people are fearful that it'll have an adverse impact on their livelihood and you know the bill it, not to mention you got a billboard industry that is very very powerful but in New England if you come into Vermont from Massachusetts they have billboards if you come from uh, New Hampshire they have billboards or New York and I've talked to so many people who like will drive up and uh, stop at my house and they'll say they'll be a little puzzled at why it just feels more peaceful and then they'll realize it's the absence of all that, um, all those billboards. Uh, so it's enhanced our value. It's enhanced the attractiveness of it. And, um, you know, it makes for a peaceful, enjoyable experience as a resident of Vermont, where when we're driving up the interstate, I look forward to that drive. Yeah. Uh, look around Washington, because yeah. this, this state, uh, this community district really picked it up. Right. You've got the George Washington Parkway that you can drive in. And they've built with what they call content sensitive design. So when you go through a forest, everything's built out of wood. You go through a rock area, it's built out of rock. Right. You go through an open space, it's built yeah. out of con the colors and everything are, are blended. Yeah, and you know, it's, and it makes it, you just feel like you're walking on a trail through a national park. Yeah, and you know, th that's not expensive, but it no. really enhances the experience each of us has trying to get through the day and get through the week. And um, you know, in Vermont, I think that this. Uh, value that we now almost take for granted of no billboards uh, helps us with our own sense of community and identity because you know whatever the political divisions you'll be talking to somebody who just will be saying what a beautiful ride it was uh, from Randolph to Montpelier uh, and that'll be a Republican or Democrat uh, and they know that they want to continue experiencing it it's part of the Vermont identity so they take care and they experience the benefit uh, and the emotional peace that comes with having a place well cared for. Well, you know, there's, and this is what I, I think you understand so well, is that there's really good economics in this. Really good. Yeah. I mean, we have, a, we have private land called Pebble Beach, and to drive around that, it's a private road. You have to pay $10. But why are people doing $10 to do the 17-mile drive? Be to look at the aesthetics. That's right. There's, Pebble Beach Incorporated didn't put up a bunch of billboards saying this is the golf capital of the world or, right. you know, this is a famous place where John F. Kennedy right. stayed or this is, you know, a, a history of this place. It's just left in its natural right. state. A lot of big fancy houses to look at, too, but... 
uh, the aesthetics even in designing You know, I went, I went out there when I was a boy. My dad, uh, we took a trip to California, and I vividly remember that. I was probably 14 when we went around uh, Pebble Beach, and my mom and dad were just so thrilled by it. You know, I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts. We had lots of billboards, and we didn't have Big Sur, and we didn't have, uh, uh, we didn't have the 17-mile uh, the drive. And it was, it was just a memorable experience for me to this day. You know, I've just learned a very interesting sort of factoid trivia that a post ranch, which Condé Nast says is the number one destination spa hotel in America, it's in the Big Sur coastline, costs about a thousand bucks a night to stay there. Mm. You'd think nobody'd stay there at that price. It has about 85% occupancy. But the clerk was telling me that, that, that people, they get phone calls, they don't call up and say, how much does it cost to have a room there? They call up and say, if I have a room there, can I see a condor? <laughs> and because condors are all monitored, and we know where they are, and somebody's following us, says, certainly, we'll, we'll have, you'll have, you have a chance to see a monitor. And, and now, with the whale population increasing, since we're not killing whales, we've had just this whale fest all summer because yeah. the El Nino That's weather's great. brought all the bait in close to shore. Right. You don't have to go out on a whale watching ship. You can just stand on shore and see whales. And then we preserve the sea otters, big fight to preserve the sea otters. We preserve mountain lions. I mean, the industry, uh, as right. I call it, of watchable right. wildlife, do you know That's that there right. are more people in America, in the world, watching wildlife, you think of safaris in Africa and so on, and all the Audubon Society, there are more people watching wildlife than watch all the sports in the world. Isn't that just, that's shocking, because you know how yeah. much we promote all the big NFL and, and football and baseball yeah. and, and basketball, but it's people just like to see natural things in their natural right. state. That's great. And what we have is, and particularly in California with such much urban sprawl, is this fight of how do we preserve this rural character of a state with 36 million people and a state that sort of has a history of, of inventing and stimulating sprawl so that we just, you know, we run out of room, we just keep going right. over the hill and That's cut right. down the trees and build a new city. And California is in a readjustment period, but we still have, and the, and the battle is because they're going up all the time and more billboards. Well, so we really have to battle that industry, uh, and most people don't know how to do it. Well, it is, it's a powerful, well-heeled industry. Uh, you know, it's pretty frustrating, I think, for average citizens. It would take the legislature out there uh, to do it, but you know, once it's done, the, the absence uh, makes the heart grow uh, beat faster. We, we, my dad's legislation, <clears throat> what it did is it empowered local government. So what the state runs the, the designation of scenic highways. And essentially scenic highways are ones that are billboard free, clutter right. free. So what the state says, if you local governments will adopt the zoning to, to prohibit these things from happening, then we will, and, and you petition us, we will put it in our map and a lot of the tourists like to do the back roads and like to see the scenic highways. So there's really an, an incentive to do that. The trouble is local government is that little landowner who's getting the rent from the billboard goes to the right. city, it goes to the board of supervisors and says, no, that's don't what's take so down tough my about billboard, change. it's my income. That's right. And, and you had to do that in Vermont. We had to do it. And, and I was not part of that fight. It was folks who came before me and to whom I'm forever grateful as are all Vermonters. But that was the fight they had to go through, and it was very tough because it always is rough if there's an economic impact, an immediate economic impact on someone's livelihood. But again, that's where there was a, a acceptance of the proposition that government did have to make some decisions on behalf of the public good. That's very much in dispute these days. So the legitimacy of government having that discussion, do we want to have a billboard-free area or state, that's challenged by a lot of folks who would say that it's, quote, freedom to be able to put up a billboard anywhere, anytime, because uh, it's your land and your billboard. Uh, and that's not, I don't think that's a healthy thing. There's got to be some private sphere and there's got to be some public sphere. You're very involved in transportation and obviously, uh, as you stated, we've, been, we've failed to even have the major, the, the funding of our national uh, transportation uh, program. Um, do you see any 
and, and frankly, the federal legislation, as I've gotten to understand it, is pretty good about the, we don't build interstate roads and allowing billboards. Right. It's the local governments and state governments, state roads and county roads that are really get this cluttered, and old roads that were there. But yeah, and billboards off the right away in. on the uh, interstates. I mean, I've seen. Do you those. see any mood to to incentivize the? The preservation. Of I don't right now. The rural I mean, quality of America. I th I think there is, um, you know, the leadership on that issue. I think right now is coming from folks like your dad in local uh, communities and well, local too bad states. Too he passed away right. a long time ago. But. That's right. Well, but the, people like him who had have his spirit. But it's tough here in D.C. right now. We can't even pass a transportation bill. I mean, that's really yeah. bad. I mean, that's a basic function of government. Um, but what I'm seeing in local communities, like in Vermont, there's a lot of focus on that public space and how can we, uh, uh, d what can we do with zoning and planning to make the uh, the community, the city, more user friendly? What can we do about public spaces and small parks and po pocket parks? So there's a lot of folks, like your dad, that have carried on that tradition, and I see them in Vermont, and I'm sure there are a lot of them. In, uh, in places like California. Now, ideally, we here in Washington would be passing public policies that help them succeed in their efforts. Because I think once this is done locally, people love it, yeah. they really do. You know, I have a uh, Ogden Nash uh, short poem that I love, and I, and I think uh, I'll just uh, uh, phrase it for you. It says, uh, Ogden Nash said, I think that I shall never see a billboard as lovely as a tree. Indeed, unless the billboards fall, I'll never see a tree at all. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that kind of captures it, doesn't so it? So I, I, I just want to thank you for your public service at the at the state level and here in Congress. You're one of my favorite friends in, well, in this feelings building. mutual, Sam. And um, I just I was when I was looking at this, so surprised to see that the st one state in the United States right. had the guts to ban it. billboards. And I thought, okay, on the 50th anniversary of the Highway Beautification Act. Let's just remind this country that there was a time. That's great. When the politics of this country was not just focused on gotcha. Right. It was really focused on America the beautiful. Right. And right. how do we keep yeah. it that way? That's well put. Well, thank you for being on my thank program. Thank you, Sam. Really appreciate thank you. it. Good luck. Thank you. more about Sam Farr's work in Congress or share your views at farr.house.gov or follow him on Facebook or Twitter.